Good morning, all. Didn't we have fun on Easter? So great. And just a word of thanks to Chris Phillips and Lauren and uh, uh, all the music that came through our way from Palm Sunday through Monday, Thursday through last Easter was amazing. And it's good to have you here, especially if you're visiting with us. We hope that you're going to enjoy it. I will add uh, my endorsement, the Created for Connections seminar. We went about three years ago, and we were talking, I think that since we went to Created for Connection, I don't think we've had an argument that has lasted more than five minutes. Now, we'll probably have a knockdown drag out for two hours this afternoon for saying that, but honestly, it's, it's, it's transformative, and we've arranged uh, with a... Uh, counseling center to be able to offer that to you for half the cost of, you know, the ordinary public. So think about that. And if you're the kind of person that takes a Saturday morning run, yeah, consider doing it uh, up at uh, the park there with uh, Albert and company. Uh, it's, it's a good show of unity uh, throughout our, our community. Okay, we're on. We've got some good stuff today. Let's pray, and then I'll read you the scripture. Lord, we anticipate that you are not silent. What a wonderful realization. We're not alone. We're not the top of the heap. We are created and our God speaks. And yet you don't force us. You wait till we listen. So Lord, we're listening. Would you send your spirit to unstop the ears of our minds and hearts? Let us hear your voice today. In Jesus' name, amen. Famous scripture from Romans 8. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. But no, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Those words were written so that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Well, for the last few years, I've become enchanted with a mid-20th century preacher from Edinburgh, Scotland, named James Stewart. He was considered to be one of the top ten preachers of that century. And as I read through his sermons, I keep thinking as I see dazzling insight upon dazzling insight, I wish I had preached that sermon. It's just so good. And then it occurred to me, well, why don't I? (laughs) So today, I'm actually going to be preaching to you a sermon of James Stewart's. That's why the pulpit is is out here. But I want to tell you how I came upon this particular sermon of his on God and the fact of human suffering. A few months ago, I was wandering in our church library probably avoiding work or trying to get my thoughts together. And we have a section in the library that's called the John Melton Collection. Now, this is one of the things I love about being part of a church that's almost two centuries old, is that there's this tremendous continuity through the years. So Dr. Melton was our longest tenured pastor. He was here 25 years, from 1945 to 1970. And just think about what you know of what happened in America between the end of World War II and the tumult of the 60s and 1970 itself. He was there for a long time. Well, he had left a bunch of his books to us in the church library. And as I was looking through, I saw one of the books I hadn't noticed before because the spine was rubbed bare. Couldn't read what it was. I pulled it out, and it was a collection of James Stewart sermons that I didn't have yet. I have appropriated it. I'm going to have to get session permission for that, I guess. But as I was reading through the sermons, looking at them, I noticed that there was a four-part series on God and human suffering. And sermon number four of Scottish Pastor James Stewart was heavily underlined by Dr. Melton. This clearly had meant something to him. And then I remembered. Mardi Gras of 1959 Dr. Melton lost his son, George, who was only 17, in a tragic car accident. With his date and the son of another elder, they had been out driving around. They turned around in their car to come back for something. It was rainy. They were going too fast. And after 11 days, George Melton died. Dr. Melton stayed 11 more years. 
I don't understand how you can continue preaching when something like that strikes so deep into you. But it certainly made sense to me that he would have underlined the climactic sermon of a series on suffering. And I thought, okay, so this sermon was written either pre-war or at the beginning of World War II. A publisher saw fit to publish it, a New York publisher, in 1941, when Britain was at war. And then, 18 years later, a pastor of our church who loses a son in a car accident discovers this sermon and thinks it's worth underlining and getting that book so the whole spine is worn because he just had to keep reading it. And now, since 1959, what has happened in our country's life, in your life, in my life, that warrants considering again, how do we understand God and human suffering? So, here's James Stewart's masterpiece, picked up a couple pages in. Now you see the crucial point that we have reached. Decisively, this fact emerges, that the man's main concern with the dark fact of suffering is not to find an explanation. Rather, it is to find a victory. It is not to elaborate a theory. It is to lay hold upon a power. For even if you possess the answer to the riddle, even if you had it written down to the last detail and could say, okay, this is the full and final explanation of the problem of pain, that would not be enough, would it? For the pain itself would still have to be born. That, in the last resort, is the real demand of the human spirit. Not the explaining of this thing, but grace to help us bear it. And that is why God gave us Jesus Christ. <clears throat> if you open your New Testament, <clears throat> on every page, you will see the living God coming towards you, holding out in His hands, not a ready-made answer to all the questions of the mind, but something better by far, a liberating, freeing power for the soul. And this is why all the other beams of light converge at length upon the cross. Towering out of the dark, the cross stands, God's everlasting answer to the quest of all the world. So let us see how the cross transforms the age-long mystery of suffering. What does the cross tell us about suffering? Well, first, it tells us that God is in it with you. We're so apt to think of God as standing outside the sufferings of this world, as if God were apart and aloof in the untroubled serenity of heaven, a spectator God, dealing out pains and chastisements to his human subjects to see how they respond, but untouched by them himself. But when I look with unveiled eyes upon the cross, when I grasp that the sufferer hanging there is not just another martyr dying for his faith, but God himself, then I see love divine, all loves excelling. When I set that cross against the background of Christ's own tremendous word, he that hath seen me hath seen the Father, then my heart makes an answer to those who think of God as a remote spectator. You are wrong. God is not outside the tears and tragedy of life. In every pang that rends the heart of man, woman, and little child, God has a share. In every dark valley of trouble and human suffering, God is always present. One of the most moving scenes in English literature is Charles Dickens' Tale of Two Cities. At the end of this novel, the carts were rumbling through the thronged streets of Paris in the midst of the bloody French Revolution, taking people to the guillotines. In one of them, there were two prisoners, a brave man who had once lost his soul, then found it again, and was now giving his life on behalf of a friend. And beside him, a girl, little more than a child. She had seen him in the prison and had observed this man's gentleness of faith 
on his face. Looking at him, she said, If I may but ride with you, will you let me hold your hand? I'm not afraid of this journey, but I am a little weak. It will give me more courage if you are with me. So they rode together now, and her hand was in his. And even when they had reached the place of execution, there was no fear at all in her eyes. She looked at this quiet, composed face of the man beside her and said, Sir, I think you were sent to me by heaven. What is the Christian answer to the mystery of suffering? Not an explanation, but a reinforcing presence. Christ to stand beside you through the darkness. Christ companionship to make the experience, dare I say it, sacramental. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. When I say these words, I think, no, Jesus, I know heaven must have sent you to me. Look, rang out the cry in the book of Daniel, as the king gazed into his fiery furnace, did we not cast three men into the flames? But now I see four. Who is that other? How comes he here in the midst of the fire? Is it a spirit or an angel? What if it should be God? God walking there in the flame to guard and save his own. How different suffering becomes for those who have seen that vision of Daniel. It is not just that God knows and sympathizes with you in your troubles. Any close friend might do that. But God is so much closer than the closest friend. He's in you. And therefore, your sufferings are His suffering. Your sorrow is His sorrow. Now, that is true of every one of God's creatures. So just think what God's burden of suffering must be. When all the pains of the world are in his heart, no man who has once grasped this will ever again rail at providence for being unkind. All our loud accusations, all our complaints are silenced. They grow mute before that vision of the immeasurable agony of God. That's one. God is in it with you. And another. If God is in it with you, sharing your suffering, it is also true that you are in it with God, sharing His redemptive activity and His victory. It is by the travail of the soul of Christ by the age-long sufferings of God, that the world is moving on to its ultimate redemption. What suffering does, when it one day comes to you, and it will, is to give you a chance to cooperate with God. Every soul that takes its personal griefs and troubles and offers these up alongside the altar with the sacrifice of Christ is sharing constructively in the eternal passion of God by which all humanity shall at last find healing and peace. It is as though God said in the day of darkness, here, my child, is something you can do for me. Here is your little share of the burden which I've been carrying from before the foundation of the world and must carry till the dawn break and the shadows flee. Here, what you're experiencing is your share in the age-long cross I bear. The man to whom that voice has spoken is now armed for the fight. For you must have noticed how often it happens that men and women who have met great tribulation in their own life come out of that experience with a wonderful new equipment for the service of God and their fellow humans. They reach the world's heart irresistibly where others only grope and fumble. The real healers of the wounds of mankind are those whose own peace has been bought at a price, behind whose understanding and compassion and calm there lies some dark tale of suffering, some deep memory of a valley of shadow, 
some lonely way, a grim wrestling through the night. If from one soul's hurt and the balm of healing and of peace can be distilled out for others, if pain can be turned into power, if under Christ our sacrifices can become part of His eternal sacrifice, they can be made creative and redemptive. If that is so, then shall we rail at life when it grows hard for us? Shall we brood bitterly upon the cruelty of the world and injustice? Or say with Paul, most gladly will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ and His love may rest upon me. Well, there are two things. God is in it with you, and you are in it with God. That is the message of the cross on the mystery of suffering. And that message means victory. There was victory at the cross for Christ. And God wants you to know there can be victory at every cross for you. So will you try for a moment ere we close, to focus the picture and get the crucified figure of Christ right into the center of your thoughts. What do you see? Jesus on the cross, at first glance, it looks like defeat. It looks like the intolerable climax of all the sadness of the world here, suffering and sorrow and the tragic element in life seem to blot out our fragile hopes forever. So we sing, O sacred head sore wounded, with grief and shame weighed down. But that first glance is not seeing the cross aright. You have to gaze and then gaze again. And those who do that who do not turn their face away too soon, make a marvelous discovery. They see not Christ, the pain-drenched sufferer, but Christ, the mighty victor. They see the bleakest tragedy on earth, becoming the world's most dazzling triumph. Their cry is no longer, O broken, bleeding victim, thou mournful sacrifice. Not that, but now this, O Jesus, King most wonderful, Thou conqueror renowned. You've never truly begun to see the cross till you've seen that. Is it not a wonderful sense of mastery that Jesus possesses right through his passion? Listen to his own words. No man takes my life from me, but I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. Is there not royalty in that statement? The irony of the situation that the high priest Caiaphas, poor, blinded, self-deluded, pompous creature, thought that he held the reins and was in control of the hour. I have power to lay my life down, said Jesus. Is that defeat? See Christ marching steadfastly to Jerusalem. Mark well his strong serenity through the last crowded, terrible days. Watch his bearing before Pilate. See him on the cross, refusing the drug they gave him, that no atom of the anguish should be evaded. Hark to the ringing shout that broke upon the darkness. It is finished. Is that defeat? Yes, it is, but not Christ's defeat. Certainly not that. It is the defeat of suffering. It is the defeat of the mystery of evil and of all the dark, tragic powers of life. It is Christ's victory. Thou art the King of glory, O Christ. Thou conqueror renowned. But what has all this to do with me, you ask? Christ may have conquered in the day of his trouble, but my battle has still to be fought. I am in the midst of this struggle. What help is there in the cross for me? Surely the answer is clear. If evil at its overwhelming worst has already been met and mastered, as in Jesus Christ it has, if God has got his hands round the whole baffling mystery of suffering in its most defiant and difficult form, 
and turn that most awful suffering into the defeat of evil. If that, in fact, has happened on that scale, are you to say it cannot happen on the infinitely smaller scale of your own life by union with Christ and His suffering through faith? If you will but open your nature, the gateways of your nature to the invasion of Christ's Spirit, you will do as He did and live victoriously. In all these things, wrote Paul, one who had been tested to the hilt in the worst tragedies of life and therefore had the right to speak. In all these things, Paul wrote, these desolating, heartbreaking things which happen to be and happen to all of the sons of men, these physical pains, these mental agonies, these spiritual midnights of the soul. In all these things, we are more than conquerors, not through our own valor, or our stoic resolution, not through a creed or a code or a philosophy, but through Him who loved us. We are more than conquerors. That is the only answer to the mystery of suffering. The answer for you is a question. Will you let God through to reign in the midst of your pain? The answer is not a theory. It's a life a dedicated spirit, a fully surrendered soul. That is the one finally valid answer from Jesus and from us. May that answer be ours. That's a pretty good sermon. Quite a sermon. God's answer to suffering is not an explanation that is beyond our understanding. It is a person. Christ who entered completely into the flesh and blood of our existence. Christ who died. Christ who is risen. Christ who will come again to set all things right. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you have not stood aloof as some spectator God from how it is with us. Your rich wounds are still visible above. You have not stopped being human, but have embraced us into eternity. We thank you that you are in every suffering with us. And we thank you that we are in it with you. We offer to you our pains, our dismay, and our suffering, that they might partake of your cross, and therefore of your glory, and therefore of the mission of your church to bind wounds and bring hope. Amen.